Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Um, as we sort out a couple of uh, technical challenges uh, with presenting uh, live streamed and Zoomed talks. My name is Blair Hornwald, and I'm the director curator of the School of Art Gallery. And on behalf of the gallery, I am super pleased to welcome you all to this evening's virtual panel, Material Intimacies, Stories in Stone, featuring guest speakers, Robert Coots, Vanessa Higgin, and Trisha Wozni. This talk is the final event that's being held in conjunction with the gallery's current exhibition, Moving Matter Between Rock and Stone, organized by guest curator, Abigail Ald. Moving Matter is up at the School of Art Galleries, Main and Lobby Galleries until October 14th, which is tomorrow. So that means you have one more day to check it out if you haven't. Um, for those of you who may be listening only, um, I'm a white femme person in my early 40s. I've got a short brown mullet and eyeglasses, and I'm wearing a dark blue flannel dress with a denim shirt jacket at the top. Uh, I'm speaking to you from my office at the School of Art Gallery, which is located on Treaty One territory. This is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene, and it's the homeland of the Métis Nation. Signed in 1871, Treaty One took territory from seven Anishinaabe First Nations to make the land available for settler use and ownership. Our water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation, which only last year ended boil water advisories with the opening of its centralized water treatment facility. This exhibition asks us to think deeply about the lasting impacts of resource extraction and settler colonial nation building. In thinking about these histories, this place, and this material, we must also acknowledge that the harms of settler colonialism are not behind us. They are ongoing, systemic, socially, culturally, and ecologically dev devastating, and deeply embedded in institutions such as ours. Conversations and thinking about things like this can really be catalysts that deepen a shared commitment to move for forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Before I turn it over to Abby, who will introduce tonight's speakers and moderate a discussion, I would like to acknowledge that the School of Art Gallery is generously supported by the University of Manitoba and the School of Arts faculty and staff, donors, and volunteers. This exhibition and its related programs have received additional funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Manitoba Arts Council. Thank you also to our fabulous ASL interpreters, Christina Morden and Shannon Hokanson for helping us make this panel more accessible. Thank you also to the School of Arts staff, uh, Justin Bear and Kaylin Harrison for their assistance in facilitating this talk. If anybody is having trouble with the Zoom link, please direct message um, the School of Art Gallery account and uh, Justin will uh, do his best to help you out. And if you're watching over on YouTube and have a question, you can post it there and um, he will relay it over to the panelists here on Zoom. I also wanna extend my sincere gratitude to tonight's present presenters, Vanessa Higgin and Trisha Wozni, and to Robert Coots, who couldn't join us live tonight, um, but made time to record his presentation uh, prior for us. And I'm especially grateful to our curator, Abigail Ald, for organizing this thoughtful, provocative, and well-researched exhibition and its ancillary programs. Um, it's been a real honor and a real joy to work with you um, on this important exhibition. Abigail, Abigail Ald is a writer and curator whose work considers human altered environments. Her research explores how systems of power and relation are reflected in the ways that buildings and cities are constructed with a particular interest in the relationships between urban environments and the ecosystems that sustain them. Abigail holds an MA in cultural studies uh, with a focus on curatorial practice from the University of Winnipeg and a Bachelor of Environmental Design from OCAD University. She lives here in Winnipeg, Treaty One territory as a descendant of British Canadian settlers Abigail is also a founding member of Parameter Press, a collective publish that publishes Rizograph printed artist editions. And she is currently writing a nonfiction manuscript about Tyndall limestone. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for coming to share this virtual space with us tonight. And I will now turn it over to Abby, who will introduce this evening's speakers. Hello. 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for joining us tonight on this ch chilly, drizzly night, which I think is perfect to be at home <laughs> on Zoom. Um, thank you, Blair, for the introduction and for situating the exhibition within the institution and this territory. Uh, I'd also like to thank the artists in Moving Matter and echo Blair's thanks to the staff and contract workers who have helped realize and maintain the exhibition and adjunct programming throughout its run. Uh, in addition to the gallery support, Moving Matter is made possible by with project grants from Canada Council for the Arts and the Manitoba Arts Council, with max funding specifically enabling this virtual programming series. A special thanks to Gillis Quarries and the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation for supporting my research and to the Winnipeg Arts Council and Malwa's Foundation Mentorship Program for enabling this project's early development. Before we move on to this evening's programming, I'll just give a brief overview of the exhibition, which is um, closing tomorrow, as Blair mentioned. Um, so the last time to see it is between 9.30 and 5 tomorrow. Um, and then after that, the, these talks will remain online on YouTube, as well as the curatorial essay and audio recordings of the artists describing their work um, are all on the website. And I, it, I noticed it's not there, but there, will also, there is also a transcript as well of the artists describing their work. Um, Moving Matter Between Rock and Stone features work by 13 artists, Casey Adams, Christina Benera, Catherine Boyer, Evan Collis, Jason DeHaan, Patrick Dunford, Kara Hamilton, Vanessa Hagen, Mariana Munoz Gomez, Lisa Stinner Kuhn, Jeff Thomas, Christopher Wall, and Trisha Wasney. The exhibition contemplates the transformation of a regional bedrock ridge into the recognizable modeled building product, Tyndall Stone. These artists consider the implications of this transformation and the resonance imbued through human rock relations. Some artists consider how Tyndall Stone's rise to prominence as a building stone mirrored the redefinition and construction of the wider region as Western Canada. Others explore the cyclical motion of rock formation and decay, the voids left by excavation, and the interrelation of bedrocks and other parts of the environment. Today, I'm thrilled to be introducing Vanessa Hagen and Trisha Wozni, and historian Robert Coots, who will each present on their work under the theme of material intimacies. As Blair mentioned, Vanessa and Trisha will join us virtually, um, but through the power of some Zoom movie magic, uh, we will be sharing a pre-recorded version of Robert's presentation. Um, I'm gonna first explain just a little bit about um, the panels, the, the theme for this panel. Uh, the idea of material intimacies is really at the heart of the overall exhibition. By using or referencing Tyndall Stone in artwork that considers personal, structural, or wider social issues, each artist makes the material intimate or connects it with the human histories at hand. My thinking about Stone's material intimacies is borrowed from the book Stone and Ecology of the Inhuman by Jeffrey Jerome Cohen, which examines the relationship between humans and stone with the aim to disanthropomorphize dis views of time and ecology. In the book, Cohen mines medieval and early modern writing for perspectives on stone that recognize its aliveness and material agency beyond human framing and exceptionalism. It looks at how stone outlasts and eludes humans even as successive generations apply meaning, effectively collaborating with stone in the service of carrying stories beyond the limits of humanity. Cohen writes, the ecological project of thinking beyond anthropocentricity requires enlarged temporal and geographical scales, yet expanded frames risk emphasizing separations at the expense of material intimacies. He later continues, the stories we know of stone will always be human stories, even if the cosmos they convey make a problem of that category rather than celebrate some specious natural dominions. Cohen writes that rock formations transport narrative. This is a statement that really resonates with me as I've spent some time making sense of Tyndall Stone and the rock formation that it comes from, and have really come to see it as a vehicle that carries an array of human histories and understandings of place. This, I believe, is part of what contributes to the aura of rock and stones. They far exceed humanity, yet are intimately connected to our human history, 
and allow us to transport meaning across and beyond ourselves. Looking carefully at how humans relate to rock formation provides means to consider and challenge how we see ourselves as part of wider ecologies. Tonight's presenters consider how human narrative and meaning is imparted on stone across a range of scales from official government-led heritage initiatives to personal and institutional histories. In different ways, these presenters demonstrate the important work of interrogating, contesting, and enacting the history making central to human rock relations as a process that is fluid and ongoing. So with that, I'll now carry on to introductions. Each presentation is gonna run for about 20 minutes after which we'll convene for the shared discussion. Um, so as Blair mentioned, feel free to add questions throughout that period in, on YouTube um, and Zoom. And then we'll come back to that at the end of the presentations. We're aiming to wrap at 8.30 um, and note that the recording of, of the panel will be on YouTube. Um, our first presenter this evening is Dr. Robert Coots. Dr. Robert Coots worked as a historian for Parks Canada for over 30 years, researching historic sites through Western and Northern Canada. He is the author or co-author of four books on the history of Manitoba and the Canadian West, and has published articles and reviews in journals in Canada, the United States, and Great Britain. Roberts has studied Indigenous history in the West for many years, and his most recent book is entitled Authorized Heritage, Place, Memory, and Historic Sites in Prairie Canada, published in 2021 by the University of Manitoba Press. The book recently won the Margaret McAdams Award for the top scholarly book in Manitoba. Robert is chief editor of the journal Prairie History. So Robert's scholarship about 19th century um, stone buildings along the Red River has been really instrumental to my understanding of these structures in the wider context of the period. In my early research, I was really struggling with how to contextualize these stone buildings um, within the, with the broader construction practices of the predominantly Anglo Metis Red River settlement. So it was a, a real boon to realize um, Robert had already done this. Um, with deep knowledge and consideration and was in the process of expanding on this and other scholarship in his PhD dissertation, which later informed the book, Authorized Heritage. So a big open-ended thank you to Robert. And I'll now hand things over to, to Blair to share Robert's presentation with us. So uh, the title of my presentation today, I uh, called uh, Authorized Heritage and the Bias of Architectural Commemoration. Um, so in my book, uh, Authorized Heritage, Place, Memory and Historic Sites in Prairie Canada, I explore the ideas of heritage and memory in the Prairie West, examining how heritage value is established, how commemoration often reflects social and cultural perspectives and how and why interpretation can change over time. I attempt to illustrate this, the process by which um, the social construction of heritage value can be part of a, an authorized identity that conforms to acceptable authoritative and official perceptions of uh, historical significance. Uh, my major argument uh, is that official historic sites in Prairie Canada, and most importantly, their interpretation are examples of authorized spaces that relate to national and nation building goals. Historic sites, and here I'm talking about sites that are commemorated for the most part by governments at all levels, are frequently examples of an imagined past or a heritage defined by modern perceptions, often with landscapes that become fashioned as aestheticized spaces or pleasing landscapes that are often idealized to conform with visitor uh, expectations. Oftentimes, historic sites, especially settler and fur trade sites, are places that have been fashioned to reflect the past we want to imagine. Places that are that often reflect a romantic view of the past rather than a past that is depicted warts and all, or in or the past um, as a foreign country, as uh, historian David Lowenthal described it. Um, 
A study looks at how true heritage is not the depiction of the past and the present, but the persistence of the past and the present. And I think that's a key uh, theme to my book. I focus upon how the significance of place is often contested and how indigenous perceptions often challenge conventional views of the past. I discuss the process of commemoration of critical 20th century themes in Western Canadian history while referencing examples of recognized heritage places in the West, including cultural topographies, um, indigenous landscapes, community recognized built heritage, and national historic sites in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. More broadly, I look at who decides what is heritage and who claims authority and why. Perhaps, probably the most significant chapters of the book concentrate on settler colonialism, fur trade, and indigenous historic sites, where I focus on those historic places that propagate the settler colonial myth. Here I look at concepts of authenticity and how that idea is understood in heritage site programming and comment on how many historic sites are the product of colonial thinking which makes their decolonization through changes in, um, you know, interpretive programming exceptionally difficult. My goal in the book is to show how a colonial mythology has been written into our landscape and built heritage. My hope being that a more inclusive and realistic portrayal of Canadian history will emerge. In uh, my chapter in the book on the heritage of settler colonialism, I, I and, and what I call the con uh, construction of authenticity. I look at the historic sites that are situated along River Road, the Heritage Parkway that winds along um, the Red River north of Winnipeg and just east of Highway 9, present Highway 9, of course. Um, River Road has its origins in the 19th century and was part of the historic trail uh, that linked the Hudson's Bay Company Post at the Forks, Upper Fort Gary, with Lower Fort Gary, the Stone Fort, as it was called situated some 30 kilometers north on the Red River. For a good portion of that century, River Road was the thoroughfare for an extended village uh, and the settlement that arose in the parish of St. Andrews, as that area was called, located in the northern part of the old Red River colony. Uh, while well, St. Andrews has, had, had started as a settlement location for several Scottish and Arcadian former HBC Hudson Bay Company officers, it quickly evolved into an English-speaking Métis parish with long, narrow river lot farms that fronted upon the Red River. The economy of the parish was mixed and was based upon small-scale farming, raising livestock, as well as hunting and fishing. The vagaries of the climate, along with the rudimentary nature of farm implements at the time, meant that agricultural yields were often low, and had to be supplemented by resource harvesting from sources such as the river and the plains. As a predominantly indigenous parish, St. Andrews was an important part of the Red River settlement and today remains uh, a, a significant part of early Manitoba heritage. In uh, 1978, to jump ahead here, uh, an agreement was reached by the, between the federal government, between the federal and provincial governments to commemorate the heritage resources of the old trail. And in 1984, the River Road Parkway, Her sorry, River Road Heritage Parkway was open. Um, the commemoration centered largely on the restoration of a number of limestone buildings. And here we get to the stone theme uh, from the 19th century located along the road, but also involved interpretive panels that dealt with the social and economic history of the parish. Picnic areas and scenic pull-offs were located at various points along the parkway development. This original signage was replaced with new interpretive panels some 10 years ago. Well, some of the interpretation of the heritage of the region was part of the, de the development. It is the old limestone buildings which represent the focus for commemoration along River, Ro River Road. These structures include the restored Kennedy House, now closed, the Scott Cottage, now basically a fenced off ruin, the former Miss Davis School, now called Twin Oaks, the National Historic Site and a private residence, and St. Andrew's Church and Rectory, now a National Historic Site. In many respects, the large limestone buildings of River Road are far from typical when viewed within the context 
the 19th century Regerberg uh, architectural tradition. Wood was by far the, the, the common building material throughout the settlement at the time, and houses and farm buildings were constructed in a style known as Red River Frame or Post on Sill. This style of log construction originated in 17th and 18th century New France and was brought to Rupert's Land by French and Scottish traders. These log houses were largely rectangular in shape, one or two stories in height, and covered with a hip, hip roof. Ornamentation was limited and interiors were simple and basic in their design. Such rudimentary wood structures were predominant not only in St. Andrews, but throughout Red River and were the homes of the vast majority of the local people. The stone residents in Red River, including the limestone buildings along River Road, represented the hegemonic uh, ascendancy of a small and affluent group of landowners, Hudson Bay Company officials, merchants, and clergymen. A particular style of limestone construction that was favored in, uh, in the settlement during the, uh, this period can be traced to the stone um, houses in New France, and more specifically to the Laird's House of 18th century Scotland. For the wealthier inhabitants of Red River, building with stone offered a, pretent a pretentiousness and character and design that clearly communicated their privileged position within local society. By 1850, the gentry of Red River were increasingly concerned with the customs and affectations of polite society and such elaborate buildings were indicative of their attempts to abandon what they viewed as the coarser traditions of the fur trade. Today, the restored buildings of River Road present the visitor with a picturesque and romantic image of the past, even if the buildings are falling into some disrepair because of government inaction. As uh, River Road clearly shows, the commemoration of the area's architecture and landscape has focused upon the monumental and the refined. It is, however, an, an inaccurate picture of 19th century life in the lower settlement. While St. Andrews was home to a handful of wealthy retired company officers, both settlers in the parish belonged to a lower economic level, living in modest Red River frame houses. These mostly Métis settlers engaged in a mixed economy of farming, fishing, buffalo hunting, private freighting and wage labor on the annual HBC boat brigades that journeyed to York Factory and the Northwest. Unfortunately, the physical remnants of this culture, the culture of River Road's ordinary farmers and hunters, have all but disappeared in much the same way that written records left behind by literate cultures have influenced the way we write our history. It is the extent uh, extant houses of historical elites, which can color our perception of the past. Emphasis upon architectural preservation seems inevitably to favor the maintenance of monuments to those of wealth and influence. Rather than commemorate the typical, we, we celebrate the unusual, thereby reinforcing traditional notions of progress, triumph over adversity, and the growth of what some historians are referred to as the natural aristocracy in Red River. Clearly, the restoration and interpretation of River Road stately stone, uh, limestone buildings reinforces this mythology and is an example of the bias that seems to be inherent in much of architectural commemoration throughout this country. So my writing on the limestone buildings of Old Red River in, uh, in my book, Authorized Heritage, is part of my discussion of how an official heritage discourse is achieved. Here I'm talking about how and why government, uh, governments establish narratives about certain places, why they are important, and how they must most often underpin a national narrative and a colonialist view of the past. So I employ, I employ the phrase authorized heritage discourse to describe how a dominant heritage narrative is achieved. How do governments decide which spaces and places are significant in terms of commemoration? And just as importantly, I think, which places are not? As a longtime public historian with Parks Canada, I was, of course, aware of the commemorative process involved, processes involved through organizations such as the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, as well as, as uh, Provincial Historic Sites Advisory Boards. 
But I wanted to study in a more profound way how a dominant heritage narrative is achieved and what the history of commemoration and its changing interpretation might tell us about those places we consider significant and how they impact the histories we remember. Of course, key to analyzing an, author, an authorized heritage is defining terms, especially a term like heritage. It is a word widely used in a variety of contests, contexts, especially modern popular contexts. In the book, in the book, however, I use it arguably in its more traditional form to characterize um, places, spaces, people, events, practices, histories, objects, and ideas as legacies from the past. I look specifically at heritage place and how heritage legacies are uh, culturally produced and are designed to create worth in the present. One of my main arguments in the book is that true heritage, at least at uh, historic sites like the limestone buildings or River Road, should be seen uh, less as a depiction of the past and the present and, and more the persistence of the past and the present. When I write about the depiction of the past and the present, I am generally talking about a manufactured heritage where landscapes are manipulated, buildings are reconstructed or largely reconstructed, and interpretive programming is staged. Much of this, I argue, is constructed to meet visitor expectations and anticipations. There is little authenticity in such undertakings, although that can be a vague concept. At one level, at least for heritage agencies, such as where I worked uh, at parks, there is the physical authenticity of buildings, rooms, landscapes, and costumes, what I call the choreographed and material trappings and artifice of living history. But another is the authenticity of voice, who is speaking and for whom. It, it is at this level that we can uh, ask what meanings are being conveyed. Are they contrived for visitor recognition or do they communicate different voices and different narratives? Do they challenge perceptions or do they simply reinforce them? I refer to such places as aestheticized or curated spaces that reflect the often imagined past of heritage construction and interpretation. In the book, I, I look at places such as Lower Fort Gary National Historic Site uh, within this context. The limestone walls and buildings of this fort is what I consider to be a largely imagined heritage where stories and meanings are often constructed to meet visitor expectations. However, when I write about the persistence of the past and the present, I'm describing a heritage that is not altered or manufactured to meet the tourist gaze. It is instead a heritage that is honest, authentic, and not manipulated and here I, I talk about such places uh, like York Factory, the longtime fur trade site in northern Manitoba. At the beginning of the book, I write about I write on how my views about place have been influenced in part by traditional historical and archival research, but also by walking these places, or what the historian Simon Shama called, quote, the archive of the feet, unquote experiencing firsthand the topography, atmosphere, and character of heritage places as something you can more metaphorically touch. I also write about contested uh, places, places such as Seven Oaks, Upper Fort Gary, and the 1885 resistance sites in Saskatchewan. I discuss their commemorative history and how interpretations have changed over time, but also how the views of these places by Indigenous peoples and by local memory challenge the hegemony of traditional designation narratives. I discussed that while much has changed at such places over the decades, there remain certain overarching historical narratives that again, in the context of the tourist gaze, are familiar and functional in promoting an uh, undemanding and easily digestible national narrative that serves to promote a vision of unity and progress. Yet despite the attempts by commemorative agencies to promote such unified and oftentimes simple narratives, history as we know it is messy. Conflicts remain and contested spaces are not easily papered over by changing plaque texts. In authorized heritage, I focus largely upon official government sites and now history and history making and a form of heritage is established by governments to meet nationalist goals and how certain stories and versions of history come to be accepted by the wider, wider population. 
in essence, an official history. I described as well how over time, memory and history have become complementary. Yet while an authorized heritage discourse still um, predominates in the macro sense, it is often in memory that history survives at the community and family levels. We all have places uh, that resonate within our recall. Heritage or not, they are places where the imagination lingers. But like the stone buildings of River Road or Lower Fort Gary, is the survival of certain types of architecture that often dominate and define our perceptions of the past. So, thank you. Great. I think if I talk, I'll I'll get brought to there. <laughs> thank you. That's so. Uh, thank you for that, Robert. Who's not here to hear that, but. Um, I just in uh, reflecting on Robert's talk, I wanted to, if, if you've had the chance to um, view the exhibition, um, think about the first piece you see um, when entering the main gallery. It's a photograph by Jeff Thomas. Um, it's one of a diptych that's the other is on the other side of the wall called uh, Treaty uh, Indian Treaty Number no. One. Um, from the Bear Portrait series. So the first image of, is the back of, of the artist's son looking at uh, the plaque commemorating Treaty 1 on the walls of Lower Fort Gary, the Tindallstone walls of Lower Fort Gary, and the other is, is, is his face. Um, so, and really, um, I, th I think about that work a lot in, in relation to Robert's, um, or to, uh, to Robert's scholarship um, in thinking about what is said on that plaque and also what is and what's missing from it and i really think that is part of jeff thomas's um commentary um what by placing his son his um his young indigenous son in front of that plaque and and and, and making a commentary on on what aspects of this story are being told um and not and kind of inserting um, a contemporary living um heritage there um, so yes, now I'll go on to our next uh, speaker. I, I'll introduce Trisha Wozni. Trisha Wozni's work is informed by the landscape, scientific research, and forgotten or hidden histories. Her studies in landscape architecture, literature, and film impacts her artwork, which tells stories and investigates ideas through diverse methods, including narrative jewelry and craft-based practices. Local, organic, recycled, and waste materials are increasingly incorporated in her work. Um, Wozni has participated in artist residencies in Belfast, North Ireland, Churchill, Manitoba, and Riding Mountain National Park. Her work has been exhibited at C2 Center for Craft, the Bueller Gallery, and the Alberta Craft Council, with upcoming shows uh, at the Milan Jewelry Week in Italy. She has received numerous grants for, for her artwork and writing from the Winnipeg Arts Council and the Manitoba Arts Council and the Canada Council for the Arts. I'm thrilled to pass things over to Tricia to share about her practice uh, and a bit about her work, Millions and Millions, which considers the site of Tyndall Stone's commercial stories, quarries in relation to her family's intergenerational history. In my mind, Tricia's work gives tangible expression to a and common desire to hold and carry with oneself the significant places that define our own senses of being. So please join me in virtually welcoming Tricia. Thank you. Thank you to um, thank you to Abby and the School of Art. I'm I'm really honored to be uh, part of this exhibition. I want to echo the acknowledgement of living and working on Indigenous lands and give humble thanks for that. Gratitude as well to the Winnipeg Arts Council for their generous funding of the creation of my project. My work as an artist exists in a space called narrative jewelry. Ralph Turner in their book, Jewelry in Europe and America, New Times, New Thinking writes, jewelers have frequently attempted to pacify society, pandering to our needs with pretty decorative designs. Jewelers no longer have to do this. 
They can produce stronger, more relevant work, which might address the dilemmas in society and by doing so oppose them. The jewelry we wear communicates who we are, reflecting our desires, histories, who we love, and what or where we call home. Although many see jewelry as mere decoration or adornment, and it is quite joyously that as well, it is an art form. Like other contemporary artists, um, many jewelry artists uh, explicitly explore ideas, theories, issues, and narratives through their work. They investigate politics, identity, the environment, the body, gender, and our personal and collective place in the world. I'm just going to show you a few examples of um, some narrative jewelry. This is by Karen Jones, who is a Black artist in Vancouver, and she created a series of jewelry works based on uh, the shackles that uh, slaves were um, forced to wear, uh, reflecting on her own family history. Hebe Argentieri um, is from Argentina and she created this piece that was reflecting um, the experience of the coup in, in Argentina. And inside the plastic uh, of, of this work are the names of all of the writers and journalists who were, who were killed during the coup. And here in Winnipeg, Anastasia Pindera, uh, Pindera sorry, um, creates work that um, really celebrates the, the body, uh, the, the female body. And um, this is her menstruation ring uh, from uh, 2021. I work with jewelry as I find it a rich art form that is capable of telling these stories. Jewelry is both the most private and the most public of art forms. And even the most decorative of it, of it indicates much about the wearer. I am especially drawn to jeweler Jack Cunningham's definition of narrative jewelry, which goes like this. Small objects that have the potential to speak of large issues, make bold statements and question accepted values. Like a piece of poetry, this is the art of condensing, of distilling thoughts and ideas into a reduced visual representation. Although narrative or conceptual jewelry is a relatively contemporary term, the desire to communicate through jewelry dates back much further. Indigenous bead and quill work tells stories and passes on knowledge through generations. With contemporary Indigenous artists continuing this practice. Victorian mourning jewelry honored the dead and often incorporated hair of the deceased fashioned into intricate designs. As Lloyd Herman writes in the catalog for Brilliant Stories, American Narrative Jewelry, storytelling in art and the wearing of jewelry are nearly, nearly as old as humankind. My work in Moving Matter is entitled Millions of Millions. The title refers to the millions of creatures many now large and impressive, impressive fossils embedded in the stone, others microscopic, that were trapped as the stone formed. Millions of fingers worked to quarry the stone and millions of breaths and thoughts accompanied the labor. The mined pits where the stone has been removed are now filled with millions of gallons of water. The piece subverts the notion of jewelry as an expensive luxury, luxury item worth millions of dollars made instead from humble and local materials. My connection to the Gillis Quarry is a personal one. My father's parents left Poland in 1903 to come to Canada to escape uh, an impoverished life there as part of the last wave of orchestrated farm settlement in Manitoba. They settled in Garson on a small piece of boggy and rocky farmland. Just before the Great Depression began to emerge, my grandfather died suddenly, leaving a large family and my father, the eldest son, at about age 13, in charge of just about everything. As an older teenager, he worked in the nearby quarry to supplement the meager farm income. Strangely, my father continued to work the Garson farm well into his 80s, even though he had his own small farm now in East St. Paul and worked full time at CPR, 
the grave shift, uh, graveyard shift so he could farm during the day and use his entire four week vacation every summer to do the same. I think he had a deep connection with that land, but it held a lot of difficult memories for him. I think it was a real love hate relationship for him. He would load his machinery onto his big truck in East St. Paul and drive out to Garson to cut or bale hay, sometimes leaving early in the morning and not returning until well, well after midnight. A few years ago, I had a personal essay published in Prairie Fire, a Winnipeg based journal, as part of an issue exploring labor entitled Work Matters. I included this essay that was published in Prairie Fire uh, that was entitled The Load in a book that I created of me wearing the jewelry at the quarry that accompanies my jewelry work in the show. I'd like to read the first paragraph. My father used to say he lost most of his teeth because of the quarry. Working on the water saw, cutting stone, feet always wet, body jarred by the motion. The quarry in Garson, Manitoba is the site of a unique type of limestone that remains in architectural demand. It has been used in iconic buildings across Canada, the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, the Canadian Museum of Civilization in Gatineau, the Chateau Lake Louise in Banff, the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and recently the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, to name just a few. Intricate fossils permeate the soft, creamy gray stone recording millions of years of life and death. The numerous fossils and modeled surface had it dubbed tapestry stone. I worked at the Winnipeg Art Gallery for many years and every morning I loved walking up the grand staircase to my office on the mezzanine, acknowledging those gorgeous patterns made from a complex history. A complex history that includes the mostly unacknowledged one, that grand buildings are usually constructed from the labor of the poor. This is an image of the quarry from the Gillis website. Um, my dad's not in this photo, but it is um, of the era when he worked there. Millions and millions represents the Gillis quarry. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. The Gillis quarry. Uh, shut up. Sorry, I'm. I'm hearing some strange noises Justin. right now. Yeah, Justin and Blair, we got a, yeah, maybe some uh, bit of an issue here. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking for them. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay, they're out. Well, that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I'm so sorry, Trisha. What's that? I'm so sorry. Oh, that's okay. Please carry um, on. Speak, speak, speak. Speak, speak, speak. Okay, somebody doesn't want me to, but I, I will anyway. So there. Um, <laughs> that was very strange. Um, okay, so my dad worked at the quarry, and he worked on the water saw, as um, I mentioned earlier, and... This is me with the water saw. Uh, Abby had organized with the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation a tour of the quarry several years ago. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I was really interested to see this water saw that I'd heard so much about. And I asked the staff who were leading us around and told them that my father had worked the water saw. And it was interesting that uh, he told me that the technology has changed very, very, very little. The blades have gotten a bit different, um, but imagine this, this was almost a hundred years ago that my, my dad worked at the quarry. Um, anyway, uh, millions and millions uh, represents the Gillis quarry. The jewelry pieces are inset into Tyndall stone base mass of the site. The larger piece representing the working quarry and the smaller, one representing the old quarry. The jewelry pieces are made of Tyndall stone or from materials I found on the quarry site. 
Um, each piece represents a landform on the map on which it sits. And so here I've just um, included a picture where you can see my uh, Tindallstone piece of the old quarry and above it is the piece that it actually sits upon in the exhibition. So you can see the landforms that I'm, I'm sort of referring to. Uh, these landforms include a row of cut stone pieces, a water feature formed by the rumble of the rock or an excavation site. I wanted the jewelry to sit above as if to bring what is hidden to the surface, a kind of reversal of over and under in the landscape. Because this is such a personal project for me, I wanted also to take what we normally think of as material for imposing buildings and use tiny pieces of it, almost as talismans for the body. I like the idea of embodying space, of wearing the landscape. As Appy uh, mentioned earlier and writes in her curatorial essay, giving tangible expression to a common desire to hold and carry with oneself the significant pieces that define our own senses of being. This neck piece is made from rusted steel bands that I found on the site um, that are used to wrap the stone for transport. And then I, uh, all of the chains are hand constructed from sterling silver. And this ring is made from a gorgeous little piece of stone I found in the rubble pile at Gillis Quarries. The rubble pile is a place I've visited many times over the years, uh, but especially in preparation for this work. It is a pile of cut but unmarketable stone that you can fill your vehicle with and haul away for about $30. In my book in the exhibition, I talk about how the first time I went there, I borrowed my dad's half ton truck and I was building a patio at a former house and um, I made several trips to the quarry and because my dad lived, uh, my mom and dad lived in between the quarry and where I was living uh, downtown, I would stop there and say, oh, you know, have I got too much? Am I breaking the axle? What, you know, this is okay. And I'll never forget, like I, I still have this image uh, imprinted in my mind, my dad sort of peering over into the, into the truck and saying, oh, no, no, that's fine. You could have put in more. And, oh, this came from, you know, the east part of the quarry and this part, you know, this stone is different color. So it was really interesting to me to hear how he knew so intimately um, from, you know, a job he had many, many, many years before, how intimately he knew that stone. Um, and it was interesting last night or two nights ago, Abby and I and Catherine Boyer did an interview for uh, the U of W radio station with Derek Breckner. And <clears throat> Catherine talked about how the rubble pile was really fascinating for her and that she sort of saw it as this pile of rejection <laughs> as well, um, that it didn't quite make it into becoming an iconic building. And that, that stuck with me as well. <clears throat> So I would go to the rubble pile and I'd return to my studio with my finds, um, figure out what I could do and return to look for usually even smaller pieces. It's soft, but not that easy to cut because it wants to break at its own uh, weaker points. Uh, this is a brooch I made from the steel um, that I mentioned earlier and I constructed a sterling silver apparatus for it. And uh, this piece is <clears throat> especially um, uh, kind of uh, important to me because the baler twine is something I salvaged from my dad's yard, uh, baler twine that he actually had used on the farm. And the rest is made from Tyndall stone, sterling silver and brass. And these are earrings uh, made from wood fragments that I found at the quarry site um, and a pendant made from Tyndall stone that represents a portion of the quarry that has been excavated um, and that's sort of made clear by the angular uh, shape of it. <clears throat> I've made other jewelry maps. Much of my work has been informed by my relationships to the landscape, both from growing up on a farm and then later studying landscape architecture. Township 13 is a piece I made that was exhibited in Lens Reflex at the C2 Center for Craft in Winnipeg in 2020. And it depicts a small section near the quarry that includes a small farm my grandparents worked. 
<clears throat> Using air photos, I reimagined a portion of a township map in sterling silver and other materials. The piece is a six inch by six inch map um, housed in a custom made box that is also 16 wearable jewelry pieces. The difference between this piece and millions and millions is that here I hid all the workings of the jewelry underneath <clears throat> so that it read more clearly as a map. With the current piece, I wanted to make the attachments more obvious and have them become part of the entire piece, indicating roads, leading you off the quarry into the surrounding landscape and uh, showing other features on the site. I'm fascinated by how maps and diagrams convey complex information in relatively simple forms, but I'm particularly interested in what is hidden in them, the human histories they don't explicitly tell. And here I really relate to Robert Coote's talk about uh, what histories are worth, um, you know, worth in, in uh, air quotes telling and those that are, are disregarded. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks again to Abby, Vanessa, Robert, Justin and Blair and all the staff at the School of Art Gallery. I wanna thank Gillis Corys for consulting with me on how to best cut the larger slabs. And um, initially they gathered some pieces for me to experiment with. And big thanks to my partner, Richard Dick, who cut the larger pieces for me and has made several beautiful boxes to house the maps I've created. <clears throat> I'm very grateful to the Winnipeg Arts Council, the Manitoba Arts Council and the Canada Council for the Arts for the support, support they have given me and my fellow artists, curators, and galleries. We are very fortunate in Winnipeg to have access to these three funding bodies who care about artists and the work they do. Thank you. And Thank you I so much, Trisha. Lost my pointer here, and when I find it again, I will stop sharing. <laughs> What is Great. going Thanks. on? <laughs> yeah, so sorry about that. I I'm I am assuming we had a what is um yeah someone who just wanted to disrupt things. So thank you for for uh, okay. rolling with that. I shop sit I sh stop sharing, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. you're good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you, Trisha. I feel you are real, of, of the 13 artists in the exhibition, um, the only a person with a, you know, personal connection to the quarry um, in that, uh, yeah, this family history there. So I, I really, it's, that is so important um, to this exhibition. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, and it, when, when you talk about the, particularly in, in your writing about your your dad, um, knowing, having this intimate knowledge of the different colors of the stone and where that relates in the quarry. It, it, I have these, you know, similar sense of in talking with the Gillis family and, and many of the, the people who work at the quarry now of their, this um, amazing connection um, to, to place that, um, that extend, there's so many of these stories um, related to the, that, that, the labor of, of making this building material. So uh, your work in my mind stands for that. So thank you. Um, okay, so now I'm now gonna move on to um, introducing Vanessa Hagen. Vanessa Hagen is a Woodland Cree and Norwegian painter and bead artist from Nimipecipic Sucker River in Northern Saskatchewan. Vanessa is a member of the Lac La Range Indian Band, currently living in Saskatoon. She earned a Bachelor of Arts with distinction from the University of Saskatchewan. Hagen utilizes, utilizes memory, tradition, and themes of nature in her work. The pandemic influenced Hagen to bead four hide masks, which have been included in Breath, the Second Wave, touring across Canada, and the Ryerson Fashion Research Collection. Her painting titled Treaty Annuity from 2018 is in the Indigenous Art Collection of the Government of Canada. And she has been a part of two art collaborations at the University of Saskatchewan, Miki Sak Ikwe Asiniak, Beads and Stone, Lee Rasad Ikwe Li Roche from 2019, and Anot Kipasikonao, We Rise Ni Pawe from 2020. 
I'm pleased uh, to have Vanessa share about her practice and work in the exhibition, which was made about and with members of the University of Manitoba campus and wider Winnipeg community, and really signaled the beginning of uh, the exhibition programming back in April for this exhibition. Um, and as this is the final Moving Matter program tonight, I'm finding myself thinking about way back to the pre-pandemic fall of 2019 when I visit, visited Vanessa and collaborator Ruth Cuthand in Saskatoon. Uh, I'm reflecting on that, really a huge thank you to Vanessa for the years long, long conversations and coordination that saw this work realized. Um, so on that note, please join me in virtually welcoming Vanessa. Thank you, Abby. Um, Justin is going to share his screen for me. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to thank uh, Abby um, and Blair, Justin, the School of Art staff, Phillies, Quarries, for um, donating the piece of Tyndall Stone that has been used um, in this piece, and the ASL interpreters, as well as Robert Coots and Patricia Wozni. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to you, Patricia, and your photos, especially of the quarry. And uh, if I ever get back there, I'd love to go to that rebel pile with you. It seems like a lot of opportunity for more art there. Um, so, Beads and Stone 2 began with the first iteration of the work, uh, just Beads and Stone. Mikisak Ikwa Asiniak Uli Rasad Uli Roche. Uh, which is located at the University of Saskatchewan in the College of Arts and Science. Beads and Stone was a collaborative art piece led by myself and Ruth Cuthand, as well as many other integral people to the piece, such as Dr. Sandy Bonney, Cindy Baker, Julian Cotelisage, and quite a few more. Um, Tyndall Stone is everywhere on the University of Saskatchewan campus. It's a foundational stone for the campus and a symbol of the institution. Justin, if you could go to the next slide, please. This is Beads and Stone One, um, installed and just freshly demolded. During my time at the University of Saskatchewan, I actually was a student there, started in 2002, and then I also worked there for the College of Arts and Science in the Vice Dean Indigenous Office. Um, while, while I was working there, we talked a lot about um, indigenization and conversations around that was occurring frequently. Uh, what, did it, what does indigenization mean? How do you indigenize a university, a faculty, uh, curricula? And as all these conversations were happening, we were also talking about um, coming up with an idea for Indigenous Achievement Week. And Indigen Indigenous Achievement Week is a week um, that occurs every February to celebrate Indigenous student success. Um, and the college likes to create something that students, staff and faculty can all participate in. So um, that's when the idea of using Tyndall Stone as part of the piece um, came up and the, the symbolism of the piece is that um, you start with the foundation of the university and you break it apart so that you can, uh, it's an act of decolonizing the institution. And then we spent a week beating um, at the top of the, the student hub in the college. And uh, we taught students, staff and faculty to bead. And then once all that bead work was completed, we put it together in a new foundation um, with resin and the stone and the beadwork. And so the, the resin is sort of symbolizing reconciliation or the act of indigenization. Um, so the piece now sits there um, to serve as a reminder of um, that process and also hopefully, um, hopefully to show people what, can, what you can do when you work together uh, to kind of start a new, I guess. Uh, next slide. These are just some more examples of uh, institutions of authority with Tyndall Stone. Uh, I really liked Robert's point about these stone buildings being a sign of privilege. Um, 
Patricia also mentioned quite a few more examples of Tyndall Stone buildings, such as the Winnipeg Art Gallery, um, Parliament, and now uh, and a few more. Early on in uh, the first piece of work, we actually did some tests using the resin with Tyndall Stone, uh, check the porosity of the stone, finding best ways to get rid of the epoxy, uh, the bubbles in the epoxy. And we found that at the end of it, the combination of the materials together was actually stronger than the stone alone, which I thought was a really nice metaphor uh, for what can happen through decolonizing institutions and rebuilding in a way that incorporates many voices and Indigenous ways of knowing. Next slide, please. Here we are. This is uh, Winnipeg, Pache Hall. This is where I worked to bring the piece together after the beating was complete. And uh, this piece on the right is the piece that we broke together on day one with me in Winnipeg. We were joined by Elder Wanda, Abby, uh, Jean, Blair, and we had a student with us as well who assisted me for a couple of days with the beating workshops. Um, so there, there was our act of colonizing the University of Manitoba. Um, going to Winnipeg was, it, like Abby mentioned, it was a really big journey from when I first met her and she came out to talk to Ruth and I about Beads and Stone One. Um, when she invited us to create a second piece, I thought it was a really interesting opportunity to uh, revisit the parts of the piece that were more challenging or, you know, and also wondering, like when you have so many people working on a piece with you, um, most of whom who have never beat it ever, um, what would it look like? Would it be similar? Would it be totally different? Um, so it was a challenge that I was really interested in taking. Um, I've only been to Winnipeg once prior to going for this project and that first time I really wasn't familiar with uh, the history of Tyndall Stone and the importance of Tyndall Stone. And so visiting there and seeing how much Tyndall Stone is everywhere, I was really uh, pretty blown away actually. Um, and it was also important for me in that time just to take in the space, take in the campus, take in the city and ground myself in a different treaty territory, being in Treaty 1. I'm from Treaty 6, I'm speaking from Treaty 6 right now. Uh, I thought a lot about the Métis history in the area. I thought a lot about the Red River and I really wanted to honor that. And I really felt like through, uh, through the relationships that I formed and the conversations that I had and even the beadwork that um, was created during the time that I was there, that it really did reflect that. Um, you'll see in the final piece that um, for me, it really does represent water and so you know, it represents the river. And also I like to think about um, just how this stone was formed in a shallow seabed and all the organisms that lived in it. Next slide, please. So here are a few photos of my first week in Winnipeg and our beating circles. We did about three days of beating circles at the University of Manitoba followed by Art City and followed by Mala. Um, we had a lot of participants. Some people came out almost every day. Um, and so one of the interesting things was uh, in Beads and Stone One, I really wanted to teach people to bead circles. I wanted to have a lot of circles and or mandalas uh, represented in the piece. And people really were more interested in um, either one doing their own thing or doing long ropes of beads. And so there was a lot of variety of types of beadwork that resulted. And in Winnipeg, everyone was really interested in doing the Mandela's. So it was, it was just neat to see um, how differently people engaged with the work this time. Go to the next slide. And here are just a couple more photos from, from the beading sessions. As people beaded with me, we would place them in the mold with the broken pieces of rock. So we can kind of see the piece filling up and seeing how much beadwork um, we had. That was um, a real unknown because 
you know, when I was there in Winnipeg, it was really the first um, in-person activities that I had been doing. Um, and the same was true for everyone that came out as well. It was kind of the first thing that they were doing in a group. Um, so we weren't sure how many people would come out. And I was quite pleased that we had uh, most of the seats full every day. Next slide. So um, the plans kind of went a little bit sideways and I ended up having to return home uh, and then come back again in July. So in July, uh, my friend Lelia the Fever came out with me and we started to assemble the piece. Um, so having that time in between April and July to think about the work, um, I also did a little bit of additional beading just to ensure that we would have enough to fill the piece. Um, some things that were different about beads and stone two versus beads and stone one, we had supply chain issues. We couldn't get the same resin. Uh, we couldn't get the same silicone for the mold. Um, so, you know, we had time to think about that. And uh, when we returned, we kind of set up our station and laid out all the beadwork and laid out the stone and then removed it from the mold and then had to, um, Sort of laid out on the table next to us and then figure out where we would be placing it back in on top of the first layer of resin. So what we did was uh, poured resin, let it cure a bit, laid down the stone, poured some more resin, let it cure a bit, added um, beadwork, more resin, cure, beadwork, cure, resin. So there's a lot of uh, hurry up and wait and um, there I am placing the first stone in the center photo. And on the right, I am pouring resin over top of the beadwork. Go to the next slide. And these are just some additional photos. Uh, Lele on the right is using flame to pull out the bubbles from the resin. And the funny tape there is uh, to prevent the, the stone from sliding. It's actually the, the resin, it, it, the stones just kind of started trying to go to wherever they wanted to. They weren't quite heavy enough to stay in place. And next slide. And that's just another detail. And go to the next slide. This is just uh, my couple of flights back and forth to Winnipeg. I really appreciated the landscape and the river and I had been thinking about the river and then I saw uh, as I was lay laying the beadwork that it reminded me of this photo and so I did a side by side and just felt like ah that was so perfect for me I was so happy that it was really reflecting uh, what I was thinking about the whole time so the next slide that's my uh, life imitates art or art imitates life piece and then this is the piece unmolded. Um, Lelia and I spent, uh, I think it was till 2 a.m. the night before, and we had our flight the following day and just trying to make sure that it was cured well and we had all the bubbles out and that it was unmolded and in one piece, a pretty scary process. Um, and the unmolding took a lot longer than we expected, but uh, here it is, kind of like riverways with, um, almost like water organisms. And next slide. And here it is um, framed in the gallery is a part of moving matter. So I just wanna say that I really enjoyed being able to learn so much about Tyndall Stone this time before making this piece in its second iteration. Uh, the first time I knew about Tyndall Stone as a part of the University of Saskatchewan. You walk onto that campus and it's everywhere, but to see it, um, to learn so much from Abby and hear her presentation about Tyndall Stone, about the material, about the quarry, um, and then to come to Winnipeg and get to just really be situated in a different location and really the home of, of Tyndall Stone. Um, it was such a good experience for me. Um, and I never thought, you know, 
making beads and stone one was a really impactful thing as well. And just all those relationships and uh, teaching people and working with them and the conversations that took place while we talked about um, institutions and what they mean in our lives and how we can work together to change those institutions. Um, that was really great, but I never imagined that that piece could become such an expansive experience and that I would be invited to Winnipeg and that it would be really like a three year conversation and, uh, and project. So I also just want to say that I, I've really enjoyed watching how the different artists have approached this material and, um, I like to think about Tyndall Stone that it does represent institutions, um, but it also at one point was an ecosystem teeming with life. And I like to think of the beadwork like life in the river, mimicking the fossilized creatures in the stone. And um, thinking about the stone, which is grandfather stone in indigenous cultures, which is full of its own teachings. So, um, you know, there's there's multiple ways of looking at things and something can have a legacy that has been harmful but there's also ways to renew that legacy into a different uh path so thank you guys that's the end of my presentation Jessica. thanks so much vanessa thank you um just to, from from my perspective, as you were ending there, it was uh, how do I say this? But um, I, when I came came across your the original Beats and Stone project um, from 2019, it was you know I was I'm writing about Tyndall Stone's um, uh, significance and relationship to institution building Western Canada. Um, and then to see that here, here are two artists who have who really have used the material to so it's let um, to um, uh, to get to um, explain that in a particular place and, and to sort of challenge and move thinking it's that institutional thinking forward was really really exciting so it's. Uh, really gratifying that this exists and, and really your project with Ruth, I'd say uh, among another, a few others was kind of what set me off to, to think there needs to be a, a many artists working with this material and, and thinking about it um, uh, in an exhibition. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna see here first, if we've got any questions started to ask, let's, let's see. We have just a, a, a bit of a straightforward question from Suzanne McLeod. Um, is Tyndall Stone heavy? Seems like the piece would have some weight. <laughs> I think this might be for you, Vanessa, the, uh, the weight in, of, tin, of Tyndall Stone. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, stone. no, it is heavy. The piece uh, that we worked with, I think that we figured it was about 40 or 50 pounds, um, if I'm remembering correctly. But individually, as you broke the pieces, um they're heavy but the resin is so thick that it just it's it just slides across it so it wasn't heavy enough to sink in the resin just kind of uh yeah that's that's the best i can do for that question yeah. but from an install perspective it's very heavily um uh supported and <laughs> structured on, on the wall for sure. Yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. with the resin and the stone, it's extremely heavy. <laughs> yeah, so thank you to the uh, plywood backed walls of the gallery <laughs> for making that possible um, and a great install team. Um, got a comment um, from Donna G. Thank you, Vanessa. This is really such a transformative piece tying together past and present under the current formation. So I Thank think you. that I think that question may be from Donna Gillis or that comment, but <laughs> it may be from Donna Gillis. Um, I, I'm going to read out another comment here, and then I, I may I have a question for both you and Vanessa. 
or you and, and Tricia. Um, Rowan Crow says, thanks for sharing your work, Tricia and Vanessa. Oh, here we go. I wonder how your relationship to Tyndall Stone has changed or deepened through our process, through your process of making with the stone. I think that um, it's just made me appreciate the labor of like the quarry, the people that work at the quarry um, and the history, right? Like le learning through you, Abby, has been so fascinating to me. Um, and like the geological formation and watching your photos from the quarries over time even. And uh, I think that I have a, a huge appreciation for the material and, you know, I spot it absolutely everywhere. It's like I have laser eyes just for Tyndall Stone now. Um, we went to the Mackenzie Gallery and, and looked at Radical Stitch and that's a great, another beautiful example of Tyndall Stone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's grown. It's, I have a better appreciation. I think that um, working with it and thinking about, um, you know, the Silurian at time when this stone was still alive with um, actual organisms in in this shallow seabed. Um, and just thinking about how are you using it now, I, I really appreciate that artists are using it because it gives it a different life other than just being a facade on a building. Um, I think that it's important to, to elevate it in that way, rather, I, I guess, just to appreciate the life that was once there. And yeah, Patricia, you wanna answer that question as well? Sure, I mean, I would echo that, um... I feel like I've learned a lot about um, Tindlestone from Abby and, and from the other artists in the exhibition. Um, you know, for me, as, as I talked about in my presentation, it's always been a really personal thing um, because my dad worked there and I, um, I, I see it now in a different light. I, I have to say, I didn't think so much about the um, ideas of, you know, what you and Robert talked about, um, about it's an Abbey, it's part in the whole colonization project. Um, and that's given me a lot to think about that's really good for me. Um, and as for the material itself, I, yeah, I'm, I, I really have, I really, I really loved working with it in my studio and I would love to do more. Um, I would love to do more work with it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks to you both. Um, Yeah, actually, I'm Douglas another... Cardinal, the, the comment about Douglas Cardinal, there's the Aboriginal Student Center or the Gordon Oaks Red Bear Student Center on, at the University of Saskatchewan. He's incorporated um, Tyndall Stone as well, but has used it in his Douglas Cardinal style, and it's a really stunning way of using the material. Um, and I was just going to echo, or not echo, but agree with Patricia. I, and I find it interesting that it's almost as though um, we came into it from opposite perspectives and then have now like learned through using it and this prod process, um, we've sort of understood each other's perspectives better. Right? Yeah, I agree. And um, I would be, I would take you to the rubble pile in a heartbeat anytime you want to go. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. <laughs> I think it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, Tricia, you were saying how about the rubble pile that it's this, or I mean, you were, you were repeating what um, Catherine had said the other day, by uh, Catherine Boyer about it being what it re reject or re rejects from from uh, rejected material, not not could that couldn't wasn't used or wasn't good enough for building, which um, is true. It, it like it's it's material that had flaws or was end cuts that just is not possible to build with, although many people make great patios, et cetera, <laughs> out of it. 
Um, but I think that in, in, in you um, remind, bringing Catherine's voice into this is such, um, uh, kind of describes my, why I wanted artists to think about this material in, in, in a big way or, or showcase how artists doing that. Um, because it is, it, it, it's not either or, it's it's all these things. And there's um, there's so much, uh, it, it, it's legacy and significance as a building material is very important and is so central to so much about um, this place. Um, and, but it's also, we need to think about it in other ways as well. And that informs how we use it as a building material. It informs as not, that's something that's in, in, in um, the industry, architects, designers, but also as people that live in buildings and maintain buildings. Um, but it's something that we can all think about when, ha what happens to, to buildings that are being renovated or, or how we use those buildings. How do we deal with institutional buildings that have these difficult um, um, uh, histories and how do we um, repurpose that or change that, that, that narrative or react against it? Um, okay. Well, can I just also add to that? Yeah. Um, uh, going on and on about the rubble pile. I, because yeah. I've been there so often, um, well, not that often, but I, went, I must have gone about five or six times over the course of working on this project. And the rubble pile has its own little community as well. So, um, you know, every time, I would say every time I went there, there were other people there who were searching for pieces. And I went once and there was this older guy who was, um, you know, sifting through and, well, sifting is a, relative term because yes, Tyndall stone is heavy. Um, and there's some massive pieces in that rubble pile. Um, but he said, Oh, you know, hi, how are you? What are you doing? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting some rock for my, um, to, you know, shore up my, uh, dike around my house. Um, and, and then he was like, well, what are you looking for? And I told him and you know, he didn't blink an eye. He was like, okay, well, I'll keep my eye out for little pieces. And then he would call me over and go, oh, I found something over here. And he's the one that actually took the picture of me sitting on the, on the pile of rock. Um, and I just found like, there's this camaraderie around the rubble pile. Uh, that's, that's kind of sweet and interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would add to that, that I think that's really something that's uh, for like black, but but fostered by Gillis by having this be an open, um, you know, it's it's a major it, um, production site, but to have this this way that's um, you know, uh, for people to be able to use this material that's that's not for production but totally has use, um, and yeah, to be able very to connect generous. with this, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, okay, I've got we've got a, a lot of questions here. Um, so Blair says, uh, one of the resonant quotes from Robert Kutztok was from Simon Sha uh, Shama, who mentioned the archive of the feet to be able to touch or know a history that is perhaps more authentic or personal or unword from official narrative. Uh, maybe your work, Vanessa or Tricia, is kind of an archive of the hand too. Um, yeah, so I actually, that's, that's something I was thinking of with both of your work kind of in a different way uh, of phrasing that sort of related to how um, Robert, Robert talks about um, true heritage is not a depiction of the past, but the persistence of the past in the present. Um, and th that uh, thinking of that kind of in relation to history making. And, and I really see both of your work as doing that, as being, um, uh, 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 these as carrying forward the persistence of the past, persistences of the past. Um, I'm curious. Yeah, do you, how do you re re um, react to that, or or think about heritage and or history in your work, or how it kind of interfaces with that? Um, 
with beads and stone one when we were talking about where it would live um i really wanted it to actually be a part of the wall just so that it could sort of um start to take over in a way like yeah. a, a piece of the institution um that's the next best thing it's on a tindall wall but um <laughs> i think I don't know. I, I think that uh, just, you know, the narrative that goes along with it and being in such an integral spot in that college that it does start to um, kind of change that narrative, even if it's just a slight shift, you know, it's, it's got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um. I guess for me, I, I really loved that, um, what Robert Coote said about the um, archive of the feet. Is that what he, what he said? Yeah, it's, it's such a great phrase. I guess my work, um, my writing work and my, my visual work is, I'm really interested in, in hidden histories and mostly that's been based on really personal histories. Um, uh, mostly about my family, but I feel like that's opening up for me, and I'm I'm really interested in in exploring broader histories of other people and other um, other you know other ways that people um, interact with the land. The landscape always is to me; it's always a base for what I'm doing. I I don't know why it it just always has been. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my take on it is, I guess it's an archive of the hand and the brain and the feet all in one. Yeah, and I think when you talk about that being, you know, your work really relating to personal, uh, personal history, um, I, I think, I also think about how, uh, um, Robert talked about the memory being um, and, and memory, which affects kind of a local history being uh, carried on that way and how that that relates to kind of um, more official histories and how that's it's all a part of it. And that I think both both in my eyes, both your work doing that, doing that from like a kind of deep dive into a very personal history or Vanessa with bringing all of us into all the people involved in this exhibition and people passing through the campus or at partner community organizations, bringing us into being like, okay, let's think about this institutional legacy here. Let's think about how these places are organized. I think that is this, uh, this uh, kind of archive of the feed is Blair brought back up or this the work of taking kind of collective individual and collective memory and using that to challenge how we commemorate and think about um, history so yeah that's that's how I really see see some uh, an important aspect I think of your your projects and work and yeah, for me, oh, sorry oh, oh you go ahead Vanessa well I was just thinking about our conversation with Robert yesterday and um how uh, we talked about um, our perception of the past and what's what whose voices got airtime basically right like whose stories yeah. got to be told um, and that we just are in that that's just become our understanding of the world and so through work like this I think that uh, you know we're surrounded by this it's it's everywhere but we don't even necessarily notice it and so mm -hmm. by changing the work and showing it in a different way, maybe people will notice it and then all of a sudden start noticing it all around them and challenging why is it and asking those questions that will encourage them to uh, maybe understand our past and, and where we should go. Yeah, I agree. Um, so we, we um... Vanessa, Abby, and Blair and I were part of um, what we're, we were a, a mini audience for Robert yesterday when he recorded his his talk, and it had a really big impact on me. I've always been really interested in history and 
his scholarship is particularly interesting to me because of that focus on, um, on, you know, on focusing not just on the sort of grand and official histories, but on the, the small things or the hidden things um, or the big things that are hidden. And it reminds me too of a historian that I knew um, who said that there's lots of wedding dresses in museums, but there's rarely house dresses. And I think that speaks very much to how we, you know, what we think is important. Big events are important everyday stuff isn't. And um, I, I've i always believed that, but I, I really, his talking yesterday really brought that forward to me. And that's about all of us little people who aren't, um, you know, uh, and, and really we're, we make up the majority of, 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 of this place, you know, the, the people who haven't done huge, grand, expensive things. And I think artists are an incredibly, um, I guess we're privileged in a way that we can, we can take our, our thoughts and, and translate them uh, in ways that do put a focus uh, in, a, in a different part of the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think of that as really uh, pr priceless uh, work. Yeah, really important um, and, and consequential. Um, we're, we're near, we're a little over time here. So I'm just gonna do a quick um, scan of the comments to make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, Mostly have just, yeah, some mostly comments and thank you. So I hope Tricia and, and uh, Vanessa look, look through those. Um, I think we'll probably um, end things there um, to let people go. Um, thank you both for, for your really lovely presentations and, and discussion of work and for engaging with each other and with Robert's um, um, work. It's, it's uh, really exciting <laughs> for me. Um, That's many nice thank yous. Thank yeah, you okay. <laughs> I'm not very good at this, uh, <laughs> divided attention. Um, but yeah, thank you. And thank you for kind of closing out the activity related to this exhibition. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Abby. And uh, thank you, Vanessa, Patricia, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, everybody, too. And Vanessa, it was so great to get to know you a little bit um, during this and our, 